Hey everybody, it's Professor Diffley. This is History 114, History of Springfield, uh, Mass. This is Lecture Video 2 for Module 3. Uh, so last time, uh, last video we left off, uh, I was here on the Columbian Exchange. Again, there's an entire video on this on um, a blackboard called the Columbian Exchange, so I, I highly uh, recommend you watch that. That has most of it. Uh, there is also, I have information here in this, uh, yeah, the definitions, the transatlantic flow of goods, people, animals, and disease across the Atlantic following 1492. It's going to have a, a major impact on both sides of the Atlantic, right? You're going to have new food sources, go to Europe. I mean, just think about potatoes, uh, uh, tomatoes, things like that. Um, it, you know, often we associate those uh, with some uh, European foods, right? Uh, even if they're stereotypical. But think about this, it's not until after the 1500s that those foods are even known uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, to say the least. Uh, and then, you know, uh, other ones here, you can see, you know, beans, uh, things like that. Uh, and then there's going to be, uh, you know, a movement of people, uh, of all these things across. Obviously, the diseases are going to have a major impact, um, uh, you know, for Native Americans, we're not going to have uh, uh, immunity um, uh, or to these uh, diseases that were widespread. Uh, you know, small, uh, smallpox, uh, typhus, measles, uh, all these things are, are going to, you know, wreak havoc on the uh, Native Americans, to say the least. Um, and so that's, you know, even the animals are going to uh, cause a problem. Like one of the stories is the animals are coming over. You, you bring all these invasions. It, they become invasive species, right? Remember that in the Americas, you don't have things like uh, large draft animals uh, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, hooved uh, feet. You, know, you have uh, some deer, things like that, but you don't have massive amounts of them uh, there. Uh, they're going to wreak havoc. A great book on this is called The Plague of Sheep. It's about what happens in central Mexico. Uh, when the Europeans get there, uh, it's lush farmland, uh, things like that. Uh, the Europeans introduce sheep and even cows, um, and they really destroy the uh, environment there. I um, mean, you know, it's not too dissimilar to later what happens in the U.S. history in the Great uh, Dust Bowl, uh, where you have, uh, you know, a combination of things, but you have uh, mechanized equipment, overgrazing, things like that, uh, that destroys the grasses. The grass is what's holding down the uh, soil. Um, and, you know, that, that's a problem because then it can blow away and it leads into, uh, you know, uh, not, you, you know, unusable land and things like that. But again, you know, take a look at this. Uh, demographic disaster, we talked about that. That's the uh, large amount of deaths uh, in Native Americans. Here's the numbers of uh, people over here uh, that they believe. Uh, these numbers have actually been recently, past year or so, uh, revised upwards because they're finding more people in Central America uh, and South America. And what I mean by more people is um, archaeological evidence of larger civilizations and settlements that they thought that in many places have actually been taken over by the jungles. Um, and so it's through uh, new forms of, uh, of searching these areas from LIDAR to satellites to drones that they'll be able to find more of this, uh, uh, you know, evidence, a settlement thing. Um, you know, why is this a uh, historical significance? A large movement of peoples, right? Especially from uh, Europe uh, and Afro, uh, you know, Eurasia, uh, Afro, Eurasia, um, you know, Africa and uh, Europe coming over to the Americas, millions of people. I mean, just the slave trade alone. Again, the movement of people is, you know, some people are coming for free. Free, uh, they're coming over as slaves. Uh, I talked about the environmental change, uh, the new food, uh, and the new animals. It's really going to remake it. I mean, one thing if you, you know, you know your American history, you're familiar with um, uh, like old Western movies and things like that. Uh, you always see Native Americans depicted on horseback and things like that, which is true. Many of the Plains Indians were on horseback, um, you know, by the uh, 1800s and things like that, even the 1700s. But that's new, right? The you know the Spanish, uh, the horse doesn't get introduced in the Americas in large numbers until the 1500s. So that means, you know, um, and, and then, you know, that's in uh, uh, Mexico, Central America, you know, those wild, those horses then have to become wild and migrate all the way up into the Great Plains. That's going to take a very long time. So even the, the picture uh, many Americans have of Native Americans on the plains, you know, riding horseback, hunting, that is pretty new in their history, right? Think about it. For millennia, they did not have that. Um, they didn't even know what the horse was, and now they're adapting it uh, into their uh, culture, that sort of thing. But again, the uh, video does a great job on the um, idea of the uh, climate. Uh, and so just going through, yeah, you can see the disease is there. Um, so why are we talking about, here's one thing, why are we talking about the Europe, uh, others than uh, the Spanish and the French and the Dutch other than the English? Well, again, gives context to what we're looking at, the, uh, you know, the English are not the only ones uh, coming over uh, to uh, settle the New World, um, you know, to conquer the New World. Um, a part of the reason why the British end up where they do in North America is the Spanish and the Portuguese claim 
uh, you know, from Mexico down and into South America before that. Uh, you know, the French are going to claim uh, what is today Canada, leaving really what is now the continental United States uh, East Coast uh, for the English, right? And so, like I said, there's lots of uh, uh, imperial rivalry here. It is motivation for them to go out, uh, the Europeans, and, and explore and conquer and set up their colonies. Uh, uh, you know, the other thing is uh, the uh, each... European nations going to have different relations with the uh, native peoples, the indigenous populations. Uh, they're also going to uh, form alliances, um, you know, in, in opposition to each other. And so, and, you know, a lot of these where you're going to have uh, you know, different groups of Native Americans uh, fighting alongside uh, one group or the other from Europe and, you know, usually against their rivals and things. And so that's going to create even more tension and even more division um, uh, there. But the Spanish-American Empire, again, there's a video on this. One thing about the Spanish-American Empire, you see it's all in red here, is going to end up being you know, way larger than uh, the Roman Empire ever was, right? This is going to be the Spanish Empire at its height um, there. You know, remember, uh, for the uh, Spanish, they did own almost all the way up to what is Canada at, at one point. Um, and, and going back, right, and that's, you know, U.S. will get that later in the Louisiana Purchase. Um, and again, you could uh, take a look in, the, uh, in uh, the videos on this, but one thing about that's not really in there is the, you know, for many of the conquistadors, it's interesting, and that's where we'll pick up, because you can go whole, there's you know, whole courses on the Spanish um, uh, colonialism, is for many of the conquistadors, right, they, they're conquerors, that's what the idea was, um, their soldiers, many had, including uh, Cortez and others, that and they conquered was actually theirs, right? It's the spoil of their conquest. So at first they tried to govern these areas as their own territories, right? Even though they're supposed to be doing it in the name of the king and queen. Eventually they're going to be replaced by appointees from um, uh, the Iberian Peninsula, Spain. Um, and they're going to, you know, that are, that really are tied more to the uh, uh, crown um, and even to the Catholic Church um, there. But you will eventually get what they call the Council of the Andes. Uh, this is not an elected body. This is more of the uh, king's uh, sort of, uh, of the monarchy's um, you know, really oversight of these areas there. Um, and you can see it's, it's ruled by uh, local viceroys. And again, take, you can take a look at the notes there. Uh, Catholic Church is the main motivator here in the uh, in the New World for the Spanish. Uh, uh, part of this is, um, you know, the Spanish really, you know, God, glory, and gold is what they're looking for. Um, you got to remember there's the Protestant Reformation not too long before this in Europe, um, so that essentially half of Europe is no longer Catholic. Um, they're Protestant and various denominations. So for the Catholic Church, they just lost half of their people, right? Uh, half of their membership, half of their followers. So in some ways, the Catholic Church views uh, Native Americans as a way to uh, uh, you know, regain uh, lost souls, so to, so to speak, and lost followers there. Um, and they are going to take... Uh, um, a uh, active part, especially in the Spanish uh, territory. You know, they're going to own slaves, they're going to own plantations, that sort of thing, uh, with the goal of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Christianizing, well, Catholicizing them, um, converting them is the word I'm looking for there. Um, but again, you know, th this is very far away. This is the other side of the Atlantic. Um, it's not like instant communication, can't pop in and zoom or shoot a text or anything like that. So Spanish crown's control is limited, right, uh, by, uh, you know, if they they get wind of something happening in the Americas, uh, you know, say it takes a couple weeks to get to Europe, maybe you know, a couple more weeks to plan, if not longer, and then to get all the way back. So it's, it's not like they have instant control. Um, so there are limits to it. Um, again, you can see this, it's in the videos. Uh, there's there, uh, you know, um, in uh, the videos and the notes on the uh, Spanish colonists, but it is also, again, coming from Europe, uh, social divisions. Well, one thing I will note, note here is that uh, in the Spanish colonies, um, unlike You'll get this to a degree, but not to the greatest extent. Uh, part of your social division, your socioeconomic uh, uh, you know, place was determined about your place of birth, right? The Peninsulares, those born on the Iberian Peninsula in Spain, um, have the top uh, uh, position. Creoles are, uh, you know, those of Spanish descent who are born in the Americas, right? Um, so they are uh, uh, Spanish, but they are born here, so they are looked at as in the New World, so they're looked at as a little less. And then one of the things you're going to get in the uh, Spanish colonies that you never really get it, it, to any great extent in the English colonies is uh, intermarrying uh, and, and interbreeding uh, between the native populations and the uh, Europeans. And so in, in Spanish territories, those, uh, they're called mestizo, the uh, uh, you know offspring of uh, uh, one person being uh, from uh, Spain, the Creole Peninsulares, 
and uh, being uh, the other being a native person. Um, this is a uh, you're going to mean over time most people are going to be mestizo. Obviously, the peninsulares without uh, constant immigration are going to uh, be a small and smaller uh, number. But it, it's the mestizo. It's going to uh, long term consequences. You know, less and less people are going to have a tie back to Europe. If we look, <clears throat> excuse me, if we were looking at this and just you know through the span lens of Spanish history, um, this is also going to create tension. Groups is eventually going to, uh, you know, help metastasize into the uh, independence movement uh, much later in the uh, 19th century. But that's uh, not for here. Um, you know, one of the things the Spanish, the Spanish wanted to control native labor. They wanted to control native labor, and they wanted to uh, convert them. Now, this is really important because one of the things you, uh, I want you to focus on is the differences in how different uh, uh, European uh, powers dealt with the Native Americans. Uh, like, for example, the, as I said, the Spanish wanted to control their labor and wanted to convert them into Catholics. The English, on the other hand, are not going to be so much, are not going to be interested in controlling Native labor. There is going to be some attempts at conversion, but what the English are going to be really interested in is land, right? Dis displacing the Native population and taking over the land. The French, on the other hand, are going to be econo are focused on economics, fur trading, and others. So, they're going to, um, they're not trying to control native labor, they're trying to get better deals and work with them. Um, uh, and so you're going to have these differences there, and that's, that is really going to, uh, you know, impact uh, uh, what happens in these spaces there. Uh, so, uh, and this again, you know, you take a look at all this there. Um, again, so it shows you some of the, uh, you can go through this uh, on your own there. There's some more images uh, that I pulled about. Spanish in the uh, Americas there. Um, and uh, again, uh, so conquest and the faith, like I said, justification, spreading the faith, papal decrees. The Pope, uh, you know, is arguing that the uh, yeah, the Catholic Church should go out there and, uh, and uh, you know, convert these people later, you know, the uh, once they start becoming Catholic, the, the question is, can you really enslave them? Pope is going to decide, no, you can't, um, uh, because the Indians have souls, and so they need to be uh, freed, even if you're still going to control them in, in many ways, but they can no longer be slaves. Note at this point, they do not say the same about African slaves, um, and that's because, you know, and that had been tradition, you cannot uh, enslave somebody of the same religion, right? You, you, Christians can't enslave Christians. Um, with American slavery, and I mean uh, slavery, African slavery in the Americas, uh, that is going to change uh, much later. Um, and there are going to be people who are upset about this. Uh, Las Casas uh, really talks about, uh, in brief account of the devastation in the Andes, really lays bare the uh, brutality of the Spanish system there. Creates this thing called the Black Legend. And let me just get that out there. Again, it's in the video, but Black Legend is going to be a motivator for the English. Uh, the Black Legend is essentially going to hold that the Spanish Catholic Spain is uniquely cruel in its dealings with the rest of the world, and especially the Native Americans. The English are going to pick up on this and really pitch it as an argument for why the English need to expand, um, and you know to save they should spread Christian, uh, they should spread their Protestantism, and unlike the uh, you know the bad Catholics, um, they will bring uh, you know something better to the world there. So in many ways, the English are viewing their uh, actions and uh, you know opposition. Uh, to the Spanish there, and so it creates the black legend again that the Spanish are uniquely cruel because, in part, because they're Catholic. Yeah, the English are going to do some awful things to the Indians too. There's no, you know, no dis no ignoring that the Spanish do some, uh, you know, pretty um, awful things. Uh, but so do the English as well. Again, so and the black legend is meant to play down English, um, you know, atrocities or you know how bad English actions will be. But again, it is sold as a way, you know. Uh, English exceptionalism. They need to go out there um, and, and save the world in that way uh, from it. Um, again, you will get new laws. You'll get the encomienda system, which is, uh, you know, the repartimiento system was where you pretty much divided up native populations. They lived on the hacienda, the uh, plantations, the farms of these large Spanish uh, landowners. They were considered slaves um, in repartimiento. In the encomienda system, um, uh, again, you still have uh, the native groups, uh, you know, under the control or a watch of a, uh, you know, a Spanish overlord. Um, uh, but they are technically free in the sense they need to be paid wages. They have to some free time. But in, in reality, yes, it is, uh, you know, not the slavery they had before, but their lives are controlled uh, significantly. Um, and that's the overview, right? It, it's going to bring a better treatment to a degree, but it's, again, not, not, not full, to say the least. Um, and there's just some, um, you know, here the benign view, right? The Spanish are 
uh, here to uh, uh, bring uh, nothing but good things uh, to the Native Americans, right? And this is how others viewed it. Or this is what the conquistadors are really doing. Um, it's a mix of both, uh, to be quite honest there. Um, all right, so we will start the next one uh, here talking about the French and Dutch real quick.